How many of you had a chance to hang out with a four-year-old lately? <laughs> a lot of you. Curious, observant, risk takers, experimentalists. I wonder what would happen if I stick my finger in this little hole. How about if I put a raisin in my ear? What will happen when my little brother eats that slug? They observe, they come up with theories, they test those theories. Ouch! Yuck! Awesome! They learn from the experience, and they use that knowledge to build and shape their understanding of the world. They are scientists. And then we send them to school. <laughs> and every year that our children are in school, they become less interested in science. Today, on average, our elementary school students are spending less than 70 minutes a week on science. 70 minutes a week on science. When they get to junior high and high school, the results are predictably dreary. What counts as an experiment in a typical high school lab is a canned recipe with carefully dictated steps and a very predictable result that includes none of the challenges or excitement of real science. These kids, we've got to give them that opportunity. Letting kids be scientists, it's a messy business. It takes time, takes materials, and it definitely takes cleanup. <laughs> but if you have the chance to talk to an engineer or a scientist, ask them. When did they decide to become a scientist, and why? Now, some of them will tell you that they grew up in a scientific family, and it was just a matter of sticking to the family trade. But if you talk to a scientist of a certain age, you're likely to hear about a chemistry set, and probably explosions. Now, for younger scientists, say the ages of my own children, uh, with parents more attuned to safety, they're more likely to talk about the time that they got to hang out in the lab at their local science museum, or the time they entered their first science fair and got hooked. So the element in common in all of those experiences is the opportunity to experiment, to ask their own questions and to seek their own answers. Now, for 20 years plus, I've gotten to manage Intel's philanthropic programs in science education. And I will confess that over the course of a typical year, I can feel my natural optimism grinding down in the face of test scores and budget cuts and, and school closures. But every year in March, I get to hang out with 40 of the most talented young scientists in the country at the Intel Science Talent Search. And from there, I transition to total immersion in controlled scientific chaos with 1,500 amazing young people from all around the world at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. And I have to tell you, after I get back from that, my optimism level is restored. Thousands of kids do serious research and compete to be one of those 40 at STS, and over 10 million students around the world compete, hoping to be one of those 1,500 kids at ISEF in the spring. We want to celebrate that, celebrate them. And through them, we want to reach the younger students nipping at their heels. And we want to open the eyes of the adults who fund those schools, who set the curricula, and decide how those students will learn. We want them to understand just what teenagers with a chance to be scientists are capable of. Taylor Wilson built a working nuclear reactor in his garage when he was 14 years old. Did I say anything about explosions? Yeah. <laughs> I remember taking our then CEO to meet Taylor and his reactor in Reno, Nevada a few years ago. And Craig leaned over to me and whispered, I am so glad he's on our side. <laughs> now Taylor's dad was equally as bemused by his son's 
obsession, fascination with nuclear energy, but he was a trooper. He even took him prospecting for uranium in New Mexico. <laughs> now, Sarah just won $100,000 as the top award winner at STS a couple of weeks ago. Sarah built a laboratory under her loft bed in her bedroom, and for three years, she developed new strains of algae that more efficiently convert waste matter to low-cost energy. She didn't even let the fact that she had to sleep on the light cycle of algae for three years slow her down. <laughs> Eric was raised in a borderline working-class neighborhood in New Jersey. Went to a high school that never made anybody's best of anything list. But his teacher carved out space for him, converted the utility closet in her classroom to a lab where he could work. And with that support, he made it to DC. And with the scholarship he got there, that kid from Bayonne made it all the way to Yale. Lanier was raised by a single mom in a small town in North Carolina. Lanier and his mother both suffer from diabetes. His grandmother died of it, which inspired his research, which got him to DC, which got him to Harvard. The first member of his family ever to go to college. Not a bad place to start. Now, you may have seen stories about Samantha last year. Here she was, able to do work of science talent search caliber while her family was evicted from their home, lost the family dog, and lived in and out of homeless shelters through her senior year in high school. But she had a wonderful young teacher who believed in her. And the scholarship that she won now has her pursuing her dream of an education at Bowdoin College. A parent, a teacher, a school, a scientist, an engineer, a legislator, any one of us can make that crucial difference for a kid, to give them the opportunity to go beyond learning about science in an uninspired classroom to being a scientist. Now, not all children will or should grow up to become professional scientists, but don't they all deserve that opportunity to try their wings? And if they can fly, shouldn't we celebrate them with all the balloons and confetti and scholarship money that we shower on our athletes and entertainers? Shouldn't we let that four-year-old scientist grow up to be the 17-year-old scientist and go on to change the world and then reach back to help the next generation of young scientists? Just imagine what could happen. Thank you.